I never felt bitterness or jealousy with my husband, but what I have felt is not a priority. Now I understand the man on a mission, the man of, who's on a purpose, that comes first, which I get, but because I never put myself first, it never allowed him to put me first either. So. What's up guys, welcome back to another episode of Who Can Relate. Yes, I'm still in my house. We're gonna be back in the studio next week, I promise. And I need a favor to ask you guys. I need uh, a little bit of mercy today, a little bit of a little bit of leeway and some slack. I'm doing my first ever virtual episode. Um, this guest I could not just let pass by. I didn't want to wait till either he comes to LA or I go to where he is. Um, I wanted to give you guys some of this value, and I think it's going to be really helpful. So, without further ado, let me introduce my guest, Mr. James Silvis. James is a father. He's a coach, and he is the creator of the Be That 1% podcast. Talk about a great title. And we're going to get into a lot of really cool stuff today, and I know what you're already thinking. What kind of coach? He is a mindset coach. When I first heard this, I was like, there is literally a coach for everything, but I really am curious to know what this is, so we're going to get into it. So uh, if you guys see me looking down, that's because that's where James is. So James, welcome to Who Can Relate, man. Hey, man. I'm grateful and honored to be here. I've been following you for a while now and I love what you embody, what you represent. So it's great to be on the show. Yeah, appreciate it, brother. It's an honor. I'm humbled. Um, so let's get into a little bit of the background for people who don't know you. Yeah, man. So I uh, grew up in Las Vegas, still here. One of those rare unicorns. Yeah, uh, not only growing up in Vegas is a rare unicorn, but then that you're still there for sure. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and now I have kids in Vegas, yeah. so that's a whole different story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but grew up playing sports at a year early age since I was six, mm-hmm. and um, parents very supportive, still together. I'm very, very grateful for that, and they've instilled some some pretty great morals and values in me. Um, yeah. One, like my mom always told me, you can always learn something from somebody. Mm. and she would always say that. And I think what that allowed me to really cultivate was empathy and listening. Sure. A a trait that I rely heavily on today, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with just with the line of work that I do. And then my dad um, would always tell me, you are who you surround yourself with, almost at nauseum, as as much he said that. Totally. And um, so you couple those kind of, you know, characteristics and values with sports and Mm -hmm. competition. And I think, uh, I wanted to excel and mm-hmm. I seeked out leadership positions. And, um, when I got them, I made sure that I showed up early, stayed late and I yeah. served the people that I was leading. And that compounded over years mm-hmm. led me to develop a skill set that I, I feel, um, helps people feel very comfortable mm-hmm. around me and not judged. And I think when someone feels not judged, they can express who they really are. And then they feel this level of authenticity and genuinity. And it allows them to be able to relate to you. Exactly. <laughs> and exactly. Yeah. And so uh, I think I've just kind of had that skill built from a very early age. And people would always tell me you should be a psychologist or a psychiatrist or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And I was just like, no, I'm just helping people. I'm just sharing yeah. what what I feel would be helpful in people's situations when they're you know, seeing problems or overcoming obstacles. And then I went to college thinking I was going to go for sports. I got a couple offers, but decided that that's not the route that I wanted to go and sure. went to sure. UNLV. Mm. And luckily I did because I found a, not only I found my wife who mm. is amazing and that's a whole separate story, sure. but I found my professor who mm. inspired me to do what I'm doing now. He mm. taught neuroscience and psychology and mental performance. And it was, that was my first introduction to how powerful the mind is and how the mind and the body are connected. Mm. And from there, I took that information, started sharing it. And that's how I began teaching and somewhat coaching. Mm. Meanwhile, working in the Las Vegas industry at the clubs, slinging (laughs) bottles and serving these drunk people that come here to Vegas to forget everything about yeah, exactly. life and party. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I could tell you tons of stories there. <laughs> uh, but that was in an, in an attempt to get away from physical therapy, which is something I thought I wanted to do. Wasn't it mm-hmm. making eight seventy five an hour needed more money. That's why I got into the industry, stayed there for three years mm-hmm. and then decided to take the leap and bet on myself and yeah. um, do what I'm doing now. So tell the people, 
Um, what is a mindset coach exactly? And what is, um, I mean, I'm, I'm sure it's an obvious question, but why would someone need a mindset coach? But maybe you can give a, um, a more specific answer. Yep. So I help people understand how they think, mm -hmm. right? I help leaders lead effectively, overcome fear and live life on their terms. And why you need a, a mindset coach is it's very hard to tell. Like I, I like using this analogy. I can't remember where I heard it, but when you're in the jar, you don't know the label. Wow. Wow. You that's know, and, and so you don't, you don't know your own blind spots. And right. so you can operate and be somewhat effective on your own, but you're going to reach a cap mm -hmm. because there's no outside influence. Mm -hmm. And then you don't tap into creativity, innovation, and there's no one there to hold you accountable to what you do or do not know. And so sure. everybody that has achieved anything of greatness has had a coach. And so, um, I just provide the mindset piece, which is usually a big chunk of why someone is or is not successful. Sure, totally. So what does mindset mean to you? It's two components. It's a story you tell yourself and the meaning around that story and components of that story are picked up at all areas of our life. But typically by the age of eight, the beliefs that we have about ourselves, about what's possible, about what life is, about what we're going to do, mm -hmm. um, are pretty much set in stone. Sure. And so unless you do a lot of inner work and mm -hmm. you ask a lot of hard questions and you're constantly seeking answers and developing a growth mindset, you're going to get stuck in some of the disempowering mm -hmm. language patterns that maybe didn't come from you, but came from your environments, your teacher, sure. your parents, your friends. Mm -hmm. Back to what your dad always told you, you know, you are who you surround yourself with, right? Um, I love I love the stat of you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with, which is fascinating, scary, and definitely makes you reevaluate your, your your circle for sure. So, my first question about um, back to the the mindset coach and and your mindset specifically, were you always this positive thinking forward? um, being kind with your inner thoughts self, or did it take, was there a certain process or a certain moment in your life where there's kind of a switch? Yeah. It's, uh, I love this. Good question. Uh, so y to answer your question about the positivity piece, yes, but I think I was, I was in the positive delusion oh. early on. What, what does that mean? That means that I felt I needed to be positive in other, in order for people to like me and accept me. Ah, uh, gotcha. And I was, gotcha. a, I was afraid to admit that things weren't positive. Mm. And so it was almost this, um, it wasn't, it wasn't a conscious front, mm -hmm. right. But it was an exclusion of certain aspects of myself mm -hmm. that didn't fit the image I thought I needed to be. And it wasn't okay. until I started integrating some of those quote unquote shadow aspects as Carl Jung psychology reveals that. I went from the diluted positivity to the embodied optimism, which mm. recognizes that there is negativity that happens. Sure. There is pessimism, there is sure. challenge and whatever you want to call it. And that's just a part of life. And you have sure. to lean into those moments, Yeah, but you can still choose to be optimistic mm -hmm. in spite of those. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a, there's a deeper level of awareness now than there was then. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it feels different. And I think people can interpret it as being different. Like mm. if you ask someone that knew me 10, 20 years ago, uh, they would say, James has always been positive. But if, if they, if they know me now and they knew me then mm -hmm. they'll see a big shift in some realism. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And I think aging and maturity does that. And when you have totally. kids, it definitely does that. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, there's well, been some I, I think it's also too, you know, there's uh, a big part of the reason why, cause I definitely relate to that. Um, I was the same way. And as far as overly doing it with the positivity, uh, especially in the workplace, um, in my profession, you know, we are very replaceable as models. So, um, I knew I had to, it wasn't just my looks that would keep me, you know, in the door with that client. I had to bring more to the table. So a lot of times I would just be overly positive and overly happy and, and talkative and, and then I would get on a plane to go back home or I would, you know, get my car to go back home and then I would be back to a mood swing, right? Or, or seasonal depression. I'm from Chicago, Vegas. You guys have, I know it snowed like the other week. It's, that's nothing, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but it, it really, it took a toll on me. And I remember feeling the same way as far as that I couldn't let people see this side of me because I was fearful that they would think less of me. I was fearful they were going to judge me. 
at the end of the day. And I think is, is to your point of when you get older, um, I think for me at least, it was definitely a matter of not so much that I don't care, but I kind of don't care, you know, in, in, in a sense. I care about my, my myself. I care about my loved ones and what they think of me and my inner circle. But an acquaintance or let alone a stranger outside looking in, that's what I mean is I didn't care anymore. And I had to be true and honor myself and know that I'm human. You're going to deal with these feelings. It's inevitable, as, as you mentioned. It's natural. What's not natural is to fight them and to push them and suppress them down to where it builds up to a point where you don't you, you, the control is not in your um, control anymore kind of thing. Um, so I think that's, it's really important. It's beautiful that that you shared that. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. So, um, the other thing I want to add to that too is, is a, is a quote by Inky Johnson. And he said, uh, we all have problems, but what makes us different is how we solve the problems, right? It's the solutions to our, all of our issues, but finding the solution is what's really going to separate us and, and, um, keep us living a positive life. Um, so, okay, so you're the successful young man, entrepreneur, you got your own businesses, you're a father, you're a husband, but you're human and you're going to have some of those down moments. You're going to have maybe some self-doubt issues, some second guessing issues, and maybe when things don't go according to plan and you may consider them a failure, you, you may, again, second guess and start doubting. What does that look like for a mindset coach, <laughs> number one? And number two, what are some of the tools that work specifically for you? So as, I think we all teach what we need most, mm. right? Mm-hmm. And I have been fascinated with the mind ever since I was younger. And, mm-hmm. you know, being a father, you confront that every day because you're questioning whether your raising behavior is appropriate, acceptable, right, Sure. And you kind of worry about, you know, how are my parents going to perceive how I discipline my child or what's the world going to think, you know, about how I raise eight, my son's Aiden, Aiden, sure. you know? Sure. So there's that that you have to, that comes up for me. Yeah. Um, so I'll explain all the moments where things come up and then I'll explain how I Please. work through them. Yeah. So there's the fatherhood piece. And then I think there's the husband piece, mm. you know, I, I, Amanda and I have been together now for, we're going on our 11th year Okay. and we've been married for five of mm-hmm. those years. And we just introduced our son Aiden in the last six months. And so there's a, and then we run, we're business partners, right? Yep. So, you know, talk about enough. trying to load the plate, you know, yeah. we got all of it. <laughs> sure, sure. And so there's fears there for sure of, or insecurities of like, damn, am I still providing what she needs? Like, mm. is she still going to want to be here? Mm-hmm. And those thoughts come up, but they don't, they don't get lived out very long because of how much communication Amanda and I have. Mm. So there's that piece. Mm -hmm. And then there's the, um, the client aspect. So I've been doing this for seven years. I am diligent in my process. You know, you, when you put in enough time intentionally and you're constantly challenging how you think Mm -hmm. you start to notice some patterns and you get relatively good at, at what you do. Sure. Um, and, but even then, when I get new clients that, you know, have net worths of in the millions, mm-hmm. there's still thoughts that come up and say, what do I have to teach this person? Sure. Sure. You know, this person quote unquote has everything. Yeah. Right. And I get what caught into the, I add? yeah, yeah. You get caught into the net worth being more important than anything else. And mm. so those thoughts do come up mm-hmm. and, and there are moments where I'm on stage or speaking in front of crowds and, you know, my tongue tied, get tongue tied. I don't say the right thing, or Mm -hmm. I ask the wrong question and I get meta meta in my mind and I have to quiet that down. So those are all the meta 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 is like you speaking about how you're speaking. Wow. Okay. I didn't know that this news to me. You're having a side conversation (laughs) as you're having a real conversation. It's happening as we speak now, but it's, it's happening. Yeah. All the time for sure. Yeah. And so, so then, so there's three levels to that. You're having the conversation, then you're most likely judging that conversation. Mm -hmm. And then there's maybe even a third of you judging the fact that you're judging this conversation. (laughs) So it's like, it's wild, man. And so you have to have a very strong disciplined mind to not let, not get lost in the weeds. Meditation Mm -hmm. has been a game changer for me. Yeah. Breathing as simple as that sounds has yeah. been game changing for me. Sure. And then a lot of, uh, a lot of self love work, meaning what, what is important? 
what am I afraid that people won't accept about me? And you learning to accept that in yourself, because if that fear stays there, then that fear is going to paralyze you from showing up as your true authentic self, which allows you to be unique and sure. own your craft, whatever it is. 100%. And so there's a level of mindfulness that you have to have in conversation with your health, almost like a self-compassion, if mm -hmm. you will. Mm -hmm. And then there's the actual skill of disciplining your mind, which is the breathing, the meditation, and the journaling for me. Mm -hmm. Sure. And then you, you couple that with real in-time practice. Mm -hmm. So when you, when you go in that mistake and make a mistake, when mm -hmm. you don't say the right thing, when you mess up, when you, you are embarrassed, mm -hmm. that's when that dialogue is most important. Sure. And I th over the years and putting myself on the line many, many, many times, I've gotten better at catching myself before I enter these self-sabotaging loops. So what does that catching yourself moment look like? What does that entail? Because that, that's the key piece. And I'm actually, this is a selfish question I'm asking for myself because I definitely can relate to you. Yeah. It's when your dialogue turns uh, shameful. Okay. Okay. So there's a difference between guilt and shame. Guilt is you have a, a negative feeling over the behavior that you did. Shame is when you actually uh, take that negativity and own it as a piece of your identity. Mm, gotcha. okay? okay. So when you shame yourself, like, oh, I'm so stupid. Mm -hmm. Or look at me. What, who, what, makes, who, what gives me the right to stand up here on stage and, yeah. and share this message? Mm -hmm. When I, those are triggers for me to start the self-compassion exercises. Okay which is like, okay, alert, uh, that language is not going to serve you mm -hmm. in this moment. Mm -hmm. You need to choose another thought and give life to that thought and water that thought until you get enough courage to stand in the presence of whatever it is that you're trying to do. So there's mm -hmm. an interrupt of that flow okay. to redirect that energy into something that's more supportive sure. rather than something that's destructive, Sure. right? Then there's the breathing that comes with that to slow the heart rate down, to mm -hmm. change the biochemistry in the body mm -hmm. and to really become rooted here in the now. Because okay. usually when judgment comes up, you're judging from a past experience or yeah. when anxiety comes up, you're thinking about a future thing. Mm -hmm. And when you breathe, you become more present. And when you become present, you can choose a thought now that embodies whatever it is that you're wanting to experience sure. now. Sure. Sure. So that's what I mean by awareness and mindfulness. Like you mm -hmm. have to know how to shift that dialogue. And sometimes you speak to yourself very aggressively. Yeah. Other times you need to whisper. And sometimes it's not even thinking. It's just breathing. Sure. So in, in specifically with the breathing, what just give us like a, a, a quick little hack, a, a, um, something we can take home and implement today as far as breathing under those type of circumstances where you feel shameful, you feel self-doubt. So the perfect breath is six seconds in mm -hmm. and yeah, six sec. I think it's six seconds in and four seconds out. So a total of okay. around 10 seconds for one inhale, yeah. exhale. Is that, is that box breathing? It's similar to box breathing. Okay. Um, there's a really great book called breath okay. that literally breaks down all of the science behind breathing. It's Amazing. fascinating. Oh, great. It's, it's I'll make probably, sure I include it in the notes and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. definitely look into that. But yeah, so if box breathing is more under like what you're understanding, let's just go mm -hmm. with that because that, okay. that'll work too. Mm -hmm. uh, five seconds in, five seconds out. Mm -hmm. What that does is it interrupts what is going on in that moment long enough for you to pause to think about it rather than staying stuck in the momentum that that negative thought can create. Sure. You're putting a hold on it. It's like you're putting a rock in the stream yep. that now has to change the flow of the water. Yep. And then, so there's that. And then there's an awareness that your thought that you think is yours mm -hmm. is really just a part of the, of a collective thought that we all have. So the fear that you experience is not subject to you alone. Mm -hmm. We all have these fears. And if we all have these fears, then we all have similar thoughts. Sure. And if people who have had similar thoughts to you that are fear-based mm -hmm. and they've changed, that means you have access to thoughts that aren't fear-based that you can then act on and live through. Sure. And so that there's, there's a belief there that needs to be cultivated so that you know, mm -hmm. one, I can switch it, and mm -hmm. two, I will switch it. Totally. 
and that changes the game. That's beautiful. I mean, it's one of those things where we're not alone. We all we all go through things as well. Again, it's back to that quote of how we come up with solutions and whether it's breathing, whether it's, you know, keeping track of your inner thoughts. You know, that's it's so important. I've I've really learned that the last year or so how because everyone has said it before I've heard it. it wasn't rocket science or brand new to me but really sitting down and practicing how I speak to myself was and is a huge game changer I, I, I go in this roller coaster of a ride but you know it's it's at least I now have the tools to to fix you know that that issue because it's so important and I also believe you are what you think you know what I mean so having that self-confidence not arrogance not cockiness just that self-confidence that self self-value and self-worth and self-love as, as you, you know, so beautifully shared your, your routine of what kind of works for you. And, um, I hope people really, you know, pay attention to that because the self-love thing is, is as just posted a quote the other day, it's not selfish. It's important. It's necessary. It's essential. It's necessary. Your wife thanks you for that. Your son will thank you for that. Your friends, your circle will thank you for that as well. And, and cause it helps with how you show up. So let's, let's move into, um, we had a pre-call last week or two weeks ago, and, and you said something that was great about um, really trying to implement depth in all of the relationships that you have. I personally struggled still to this day, and it was worse before, but as far as keeping people at a surface distance, like a Heisman you know, trophy, if you guys are watching, level, right? Um, fearful of abandonment, fearful of being judged to the point where now I am shameful of myself. Um, fearful of criticism, whether it's constructive or not. And so it's been um, evident in, again, all the relationships that I have. And at least I'm aware of it now. I accept it and I'm putting in the work. But um, when you said that, it it really sparked my attention, I'm sure it will for a lot of people. So if you just want to touch on, again, how important it is to have depth in your relationship and relationships. Yeah. So depth is super important and it's something we all crave, but in order to get it, you have to release control and you have to be vulnerable. And for so many people, myself yeah. included for the longest time, and even still working through it, sure, vulnerability is seen as weakness. Yep. And if you grew up in an environment where you were taken advantage of, or you were hurt, or you were betrayed, mm-hmm. or you were, you let someone in and they hurt you, right? Mm-hmm. Then there's armor that you have. and. Sure. In order to prevent that again, you feel that you need to control everything. Totally. Well, first off, you can't control everything. (laughs) You can give yourself the illusion that you can. Yeah. uh, And you can play it so safe that, again, it gives you the illusion that you're Mm -hmm. controlling your life. But as 2020 taught us, (laughs) there ain't nothing you can control outside of yourself, (laughs) right? Exactly. So when you let go of the superficial relationships that are, it's, that it's easy to to create connection, but it's hard to create depth. When you let go of that in search of the depth, you also subject yourself to potential pain. And I don't think a lot of people are willing to do that. Mm -mm. But if you're not willing to do that, then you can't have the depth. And Mm -hmm. if you can't have the depth, then you don't have trust Mm -hmm. and you don't have honesty. Yeah. And, and you don't have the types of conversations that are timeless. And what yeah. I mean by that is like, hopefully everyone listening has had one moment in their life where they were talking to someone and time just flew by. It was, sure. you felt so connected in the moment to you, to the person, to the message, to the mm-hmm. content that it was fun. Yeah. And it was, it, but it was also like you were on edge, but in a good way. Sure. Yeah. It was exciting. Exactly. Yeah. And I, th- I think that that can be a regular thing, mm-hmm. but we need to, we need to work through our fear of intimacy. We need to work through the fear of rejection. Sure. We need to work through accepting ourselves because until we do, no one else is going to give us the respect that, that we deserve sure. because it always comes from us and we always project what's going on inside yeah. that other people pick up on. So you, you mentioned timeless, which is, which is a, a word that for some reason stuck out to me. And, and, uh, just again, going back to my own personal experiences, um, it's about having a timeless relationship as well. You know what I mean? And, and in order to have the best relationship that you, you want, whether it's again, in, with a, um, intimate relationship or a friendship or even a family member, it's all about the vulnerability and transparency as you also touched on how vulnerability has been programmed for men, especially to be considered a sign of weakness. 
And I've been saying on here since I started, it's actually the opposite. It's a sign of bravery. It's a sign of emotional maturity. It's, it's a sign of mental uh, maturity. And it's also a sign of I've been there, done that, and it didn't work. And I know why, at least in this department, it's because I couldn't be vulnerable and I couldn't be transparent. So um, when I rewatch this episode and when I'm spending hours editing, I will definitely <laughs> implement that you know, nonstop because it is still something I'm working on today. And, and the reason why is because it's, it's, at least for me, coming from my childhood and my background, even with relationship experiences, it's still not easy to just trust that person, even though someone is constantly saying it or showing, more importantly, I won't leave you. It's okay. This, you know, this is a safe space kind of thing. We, for people like me who are just so guarded still, we're just like ready at all times. We're tense and and we're just preparing ourselves for the exit strategy. Um, Information like this is for us easier said than done. But like anything else, the more you implement it, the more you practice it, the more you'll be able to do it. So it's, it's, uh, you know, it's it's beautiful that you shared that. Right. Um, to okay, piggyback sorry. off that real quick, I don't sure. think it not it it's not like we're saying that you need to be vulnerable with everybody, right? No, like, yeah, sure. There's a level of connection that is established through common values, through totally. maybe common goals. And so mm-hmm. for anyone wondering, well, how do I know the difference of like when to be vulnerable, when not to? Mm-hmm. When you have an when you've established a connection that feels good, like mm-hmm. go off the feeling, right? I like what we're talking about. I enjoy this person's company. Mm-hmm. I'd like to take it deeper. Yep. that's where vulnerability is going to be called into question. Ultimately, you you will know if, if you're having the resistance <laughs> uh, to lean in, that's mm-hmm. probably when you need to lean in. And it doesn't necessarily mean you got to share a whole life story then, but sure. you can share it in degrees. You can sure. share it a, over time. Yep. But each time you're sharing more of yourself mm-hmm. and then you measure it. How mm-hmm. did they perceive that? Yeah. Did they say anything that was red flags or... You know, like there's stages. Mm -hmm. We're not just saying going zero to a hundred, but work on the layers. Sure. Totally. So I, this morning was actually listening to one of your episodes and, uh, you know, it's, it's all about clickbait, right? Like what, what title kind of catches my eye. And, and, and it's also, uh, particularly pertaining to what I'm currently going through in my life, right? I think the average listener can relate to that. So you had an episode on, um, how to stay together as your relationship grows. And when I first read that, I thought, well, shouldn't that be easy? It's easy to stay together when you're growing. It's hard to stay together when you're not growing, right? But even with growth comes challenges, comes adversity, comes uncomfortableness, right? And so you had a guest on, Isabel Levy, and she said something that I think is just so important to everyone in relationships. So guys, pay attention. This, this was her saying, I never felt bitterness or jealousy with my husband, but what I have felt is, not a priority. Now I understand the man on a mission, the man of, who's on a purpose that comes first, which I get, but because I never put myself first, it never allowed him to put me first either. So <laughs> talk about who can relate to that. Um, I, I just want to start and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Um, I struggle with that. When I set my eye on a prize, it's very common for me to get to like a tunnel vision mode where I don't really see anyone else, see anything else. I'm just like locked in. It's partly how I got my wife, you know, so it, it could be used as a pro, right? But now that I have my wife and now that I have this newborn baby and who can relate, I have found oftentimes that we've, um, it's, it's caused some type of divide in our, in our relationship, our marriage, because I'm locked into the office because I'm obsessed with, with now working, which is a rare thing for me and something that she wasn't accustomed to when we first started dating, especially being long distance. You don't really get to see everything until you move in. And so I know at times she has mentioned, maybe not in the words of, I don't feel like a priority, but she's definitely said, I don't feel like I'm enough, or I don't feel like we spent enough time together, et cetera. So for someone who, in your shoes, specifically in your life, who not only has a family with, you know, with your wife, but you also work with your wife, how do you guys balance the priority in your relationship, the priority in your work, the priority in your parenting, and then what were some of the uh, trial and error moments, if, if you care to share, as to how you guys came up with your solutions? So, uh, first off, I, I wouldn't say that we have this mastered, and I think it gets it, it it as you take on more challenges, it gets you get better at navigating it, but I don't think it's ever easy. 
Yeah. Um, and then I also want to tackle the word balance because I don't believe in balance. Okay. And I think people use it as a way to beat themselves up mm. for and feel guilty over not spending time where they need to spend time. Mm -hmm. I, through my wife, actually have adopted more of a harmonious lifestyle, which means that there's seasons to things. Okay. Right. So there it may be times in my business and in hers where she needs mo more time spent there. Mm -hmm. And as long as we communicate that when it's happening, sometimes before it happens and mm -hmm. definitely after it happens, then there's a lot of understanding on where things need to be and how yeah. each other feels about the things that are going on. Mm. And, and I find that that minimizes a lot of the unnecessary guilt that okay. we experience, or at least I experience by doing the work that I love. I don't want to have guilt over doing what I love. So that's what I mean by harmonious, mm -hmm. right? It's like right now or in the summer, this summer, I'm going to be traveling to probably 15 different states. I'll be traveling every weekend. Wow. And knowing that that's going to be happening, I already am telling my wife that it's going to be happening. Mm -hmm. And we're already recruiting help for that time so that sure. when it happens, it's not so all of a sudden. Sure. And so we, we communicate regularly, like daily about mm -hmm. what we're feeling, what's going on, what each other needs so that we can adapt and move to fit those needs. Yeah. Um, but sometimes the business is a priority. Other times sure. we're the priority. Um, sure. And you had a baby in there and that, <laughs> that, that's really challenging. And, and yeah. we have to schedule our days very effectively. Like I'm the morning person with Aiden. She's mm -hmm. the, uh, she obviously has to feed him. So there's built in time for that. We've hired sure. a babysitter now for certain days. So there's a lot of things that we're doing, um, to offset that, but mm. it's mostly just being proactive with, with communication. And I don't think sure. a lot of people do that. And yep. when you're in business together, you got to know a few things. You got to know each other's needs. Yep. You have to know their strengths and you got to know their weaknesses. Mm. And sometimes they won't tell you. So you'll either have to ask mm -hmm. or hopefully they'll want to tell you and know how to tell you so that <laughs> both of you are on the same page. Sure. But like when Amanda, because Amanda originally helped me build the Be That 1% brand and podcast. Mm -hmm. It's something mm -hmm. that I created back in 2012 and she helped it. She helped me bring it to a movement of what it is now. Sure. And as she was working with me, she didn't tell me how she was feeling about helping me and it distracting from her doing her thing. Mm. And I've always told her, I was like, babe, I don't, I don't want you to get lost in something that I love. I want you to be able yeah. to do what you love. And, and, she didn't affirm that she, she said, mm. cool, thank you. But she didn't really tell me how she felt. And maybe she didn't even know what she was feeling at the time. Sure, sure. And then it came a point where she was like, I, I love what you're doing and I, I'll continue to help you, but I want to do my own thing. Mm. And that was a conversation that wasn't easy to have. Mm -hmm. It was emotional, but we both understood and we made it happen. Sure. And so we've learned to lean into hard conversations mm -hmm. um, and we have a really good pulse on each other's needs, strengths, and weaknesses. Totally. Her strengths are creativity uh, and systematic thinking and her weakness is deadlines. Like she needs <laughs> deadlines and yeah, yeah. I'm not going to hold her to those deadlines. Sure. Uh, and so there was something that we had to manage there. And then she knows all my strengths, all my weaknesses and stuff. And so there's a mutual understanding that needs to be had in order for life to work with somebody, but especially for business and, totally. and fatherhood and parenthood. Um, that was great and so insightful. And I think one of the things I took from that is, again, back to vulnerability. If you're not able to communicate with your partner what it is that you lack or that's a weakness of yours, or and it doesn't necessarily have to be in like a chore that you have a hard time doing or a, a um, particular problem, but it could just also be I have a hard time articulating how I feel, I have a hard time being vulnerable with my words and, and feeling like you're not going to judge me or, and I'm sure, especially for a woman who's a mother, you know, or even a wife, when you have certain responsibilities that they take very much so in pride in as we do as well. And so I'm, I'm sure it's, if there's a struggle of women who are just saying, Hey, I, I need help with the baby, you know, it's, right. I think for a lot of things, men are like, I got it, I'll do it. I'm sure for women with that particular department with the baby, it's like, I got it, I'll do it. You know what I mean? So, um, it's, it's great that you guys have that level of transparency, the level of vulnerability and the level of just, um, comfortability that you guys can go to one another in, in times of, of adversity. Cause again, it's, it's inevitable. It's not if it's when, 
uh, things are going to go, you know, arise or, or not go according to plan, but it's how you guys can come together and go towards the solution as opposed to running from the solution or, or it allowing it to be a divide between you guys. Things to that one yeah, yeah. is, um, she's constantly giving me feedback <laughs> and so I'm just like, yes, thank you. Got it. Yeah. And then, and then the, the other piece is there is still guilt. Like no matter, no matter how harmonious, no matter how many conversations and, and proactive communication, yeah. like part of me still feels right now, even during this interview that I could be downstairs with my wife and with my son. So totally. I don't know if that will ever go away. Mm -hmm. And maybe that, that's a good thing because it keeps us, um, it keeps, it keeps, it keeps reminding us of what's important, right? Totally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's definitely minimized due to the harmonious moving of priority, depending on the situation. Sure. Cool. So I think if we can kind of, um, before we get into the, uh, rapid fire questions and, and where people can find you and stuff, um, maybe we can just sum up some final takeaways here. I mean, we, we talked about some, some amazing stuff, some beautiful stuff that I know will help out a lot of people. Um, what are some things that you hope people will be able to, um, relate to and listening to this or watching? I hope people that are listening are either learning and or being reminded that their life comes down to how they think mm -hmm. and what they do. Mm. And if you can create congruence between what you think and what you do, that is integrity. And if you can be intentionally and in, live in integrity intentionally, yeah. I think your life will be fulfilling. I'll be, I think it'll be more rich and it'll give you greater awareness around who you are and how powerful you can be yeah. when you accept that. So that's, that's, that's like the first kind of fundamental premise, but yeah. I think making it even more fun, mm -hmm. looking at life as a story to, to, uh, to borrow Donald Miller's kind of philosophy here, right? Like yeah, yeah. we're all characters in a story and sure. depending on what character you assign to, whether that's a hero, a victim, a villain, mm -hmm. uh, you're naturally gonna attract the lifestyle of that character. Yeah. Right. And so being aware of what story you're telling, what story you're living and, or what story you want to be experiencing are all very, very important. And the more awareness you can have over that, the, the more fun life becomes, because mm -hmm. if you view yourself as a hero or want to be a hero, sure. A hero doesn't become a hero until he goes through challenge mm -hmm. and gets through it. Yep. And so if you want to be a hero and currently you're going through a challenge, having that frame gives you just enough hope and optimism to endure whatever the struggle or the challenge is. Mm -hmm. And then once you come through it, which, you know, as an example, we all came through 2020. Yeah. Uh, then we can turn around and inspire or empower other people to do the same. Sure. So I think that's important to think about. That's, that's great. And, and, uh, Donald Miller is the author of a couple of books, but the one I recently gave you, which is, uh, building a story brand. And I shared it on my fresh start episode and, um, his book, it has really helped me outline structure and just come up with the overall creation of who can relate and where I wanted to take it. And this is perfect to tie into what you do for a living, which is a mindset coach. It's important to, um, touch on the, the biggest part of the book, aside from being the hero, is the hero and or character meets a guide. And you, my friend, are the guide to a lot of people. And it's so important that people understand, my, my takeaway is everyone can still grow, get better, and learn. I don't care how successful you are in, in your craft or how you know early you are in, into the stages of developing your craft. It's important to seek and reach out for help. It's important to seek and reach out to mentors, to advisors that you look up to that you're trying to be, become one day, um, especially for men. you know We have such a hard time asking for help, and it's because we think we failed or it's because we think we're inadequate to handle a problem, but why don't we just flip it and just realize it just means we're not alone take advantage of the opportunity and the resources that are around you of your loved ones and your inner circle that are like, Hey, James, Hey, Justin, I'm, I'm here to help you guys out. Should you need anything right now? The army's helping someone out because <laughs> it's pretty loud. Um, but no, so it's, it's so important that, um, again, I, I, I made sure I wanted to bring that up because you are the guide to a lot of people's stories that will help them go from their issue and their problem 
working with you and overall coming up with the right solutions and, and living the best life that they can live. So it's important. The other thing I wanted to add as a takeaway is just that reminder that we all go through those self-doubt moments. We all go through that. I love the the meta meta. I'm going to, I'm going to do more research on that when we, when we get off this call because, um, I really want to learn about that because that is me. I, when, when I'm interviewing people, I'm like, I'll ask a question or I'm reflecting back on the episode that is so far. And I'm like, I should have said this better. I could have done that better. And then what happens is it takes me away from being present with the guest. So sometimes I like lose what they're saying. And I'll, like while I'm editing, I'm watching, I'm like, they said something brilliant. Why didn't I jump on that? I'm like, because I was probably in my head thinking about why I didn't ask the question the way I wanted to. So um, it's great that you, yeah. Can I, can I have to touch on that a little bit? Please, sure. Yeah, so I think it's important for people to find their values in their life, right? What mm-hmm. they stand for. And one of my values, my actually my number one value is mm. presence. Mm. And many yeah. people have different definitions, but how I choose to define it is a state of being mm-hmm. without judgment. Sure without judgment being key piece. And I was leading a retreat this past weekend with a, f- a room full of pretty successful leaders, yeah. 10, 10 men, one woman. And one of the leaders asked, you know, how am I able to connect with people so well? And what, basically what I said is I, I, I forget about myself yeah. and I enter the other person. Hmm. Yeah. And it takes a certain level of, of self-worth there because sure. if, I, if I'm not secure in who I am, I'm going to be analyzing how they think of me because I want sure. their acceptance, right? Or, or, or comparing. Or comparing, right. Yeah. Um, when you get to the point where you can let quiet that or let go yeah. of that, then yeah. you can be so in somebody else sure. that the right answers and the questions emerge from the listening. Yeah. You just have to listen. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. But then, yeah. But then it's like, okay, well, what do I, what do I listen to? And it's, yeah. it's like, as you're listening, more thoughts can come up. And so that's the meta meta, right? That's sure. when you know, you're like, oh crap, my mind's going, <laughs> bring it back here. Yeah. Be present, be present. So like, totally. I, that, I love that process and totally. I, I, I'm glad that you talk about it because it's something yeah. that I think we all want and desire and we sure. all can get better at. Okay. So with all that being said, I'm sure a lot of people right now are like, okay, James sold. So can you let people know what you're working on now, where they can find you and how they can get in touch with you? The easiest way is through Instagram. That's where I spend most of my time. Okay. Um, I'm sure you'll put that in the show notes. Yep. And then I do have a podcast. If you want to just continue to hear, you know, things that I've learned and strategies that have worked for me, that's mm-hmm. be that 1% podcast. Um, also be in the show notes. And then, um, yeah, well, I mean, so there, that's how you can reach me. And then kind of some things that I have coming up are usually every year I have a, a live event in Vegas, okay. Okay. probably around October. Um, this 2020 kind of threw a monkey wrench and everything. So sure. just be on the lookout for that. I also hold masterminds both on my own and then through companies. So if you have a group of people that you're wanting to uh, challenge and or get closer to and have them step into their next level of leadership, um, definitely would love to, to speak with you. And also, if you want to take your game to the next level and work intimately, then I do offer one-on-one sessions. So if any of that resonates, would love to serve and, and yep. at least connect. So For sure. And I'll make sure I include all that in the show notes, um, as I think you're going to add a lot of value to a lot of people. Um, okay, so let's get into the round of rapid fire questions, my friend. This is the, uh, you can relax now. All the hard work's done. Um, okay. First question is, and this is um, a selfish question again, but I do think it's going to add value to a lot of people. So one thing that I do when I travel or when I did before COVID, um, anytime I would meet someone who was married, I would always ask them two questions. And so these two are for you. What is the best advice you would give being a married man? And what's the best advice you've ever received about marriage? So one of the best uh, pieces of advice that I received was actually on my wedding day. Okay. I was sitting uh, with my group of groomsmen and then the, the restaurant that was connected to the venue that we were doing it at. Mm-hmm. And I just asked all my guys to just say a prayer over me mm-hmm. and they all put their hands on me and I've never experienced so much love from a group of men in my entire life. And it was wow. beautiful. Yeah. Uh, after that moment, we found out that there was a couple sitting in that same restaurant that had been married for no joke. 70 
years. Wow. <laughs> okay. So talk about a good omen. Yeah. Right. And uh, we were just shocked and we're like, what, how, <laughs> how does that even possible? Like, what yeah, do you, yeah. what do you suggest? Like my wedding yeah. day, what do you got? Yeah. And they were, it was, it was, I'm going to summarize. It wasn't specific. Cause that was sure. six years ago, five, six years ago, but mm. it was, it was just play. Mm. Don't forget to play. Yeah. Yeah. You know, sometimes we can make things so uh, ceremony like or structured or, yeah. or um, just we have to do it this way and, mm -hmm. and we forget to play. And I forget that all the time. And so totally. really leaning into that uh, when it makes sense, I think would be very helpful. Yeah. What I would suggest mm -hmm. would be to at least do some sort of personal development work before you get married. Totally. Yep. And if, and not to say that if you don't, it won't be successful, you, but you dramatically increase your chances, sure. knowing what triggers you, knowing how your upbringing affects how you'll be with that person and or affect the type of environment you raise your kid in, kids mm -hmm. in. That's so, so important. Mm -hmm. And so whether that's working with someone like a coach or a therapist or, or reading some books, like something that sure. increases your awareness because times will get hard. You will have arguments. Yeah. You will have fear come up all the time. Mm -hmm. And you got to have some skills to learn how to navigate that or else sure. that fear will hijack you. You'll say things you don't mean, do things yeah. you don't want to do, and it'll just turn into a mess. Okay. Question number two. What is your number one goal in 2021? My definition of success is doing what I love with who I love. Mm. And I think... 2021 is about reaching deeper levels of that. Yeah. So really asking my question, my, myself in my business, you know, what do I love doing and how can I spend more time doing that yeah. in, in the time that I've allotted for my business and then who I love, which would include my family, my friends, my support staff, everyone that I would fall into that category. How can I have deeper levels of love with them and, and, and really maximize and squeeze the time that I have with them as much mm. as I can? Mm. That's great. I, I love that. And that's something that uh, I'm sure is a goal every year <laughs> for you, not, <laughs> not, not just this year. Um, question number three, what do you want to be known for when you leave this earth? Think legacy. When you talk to me, you felt like the most important person in the world. Wow. Talk about being present, right? That's great, man. That's beautiful. Wow. Question number four, what's something you want women to know about men? <laughs> We're not all assholes, <laughs> right? Let's just start there. Uh, yeah, right. Um, I think men are misunderstood from the perspective that if, if I'm speaking from a relationship standpoint, an yeah. intimate relationship, mm -hmm. I think they care more. They care about you more than they think they do when they, yeah. when they're not spending time with you. Mm. And if there can be just a little bit more appreciation there, I think mm -hmm. it would soften some of the conflict that arises from that misunderstanding. Sure. You know, a lot of, a lot of men, myself included, only do what I do. Well, I do what I do because I love it, but I also do what I do to take care of my family. And totally. although I do articulate that, mm -hmm. I don't know if I do it enough. And I'm sure other men feel the same when, yeah. you know, maybe we're spending too much time on something and our, and our, our wives or girlfriends or whatever mm -hmm. are, you know, not feeling like a priority or not feeling like they're um, valued in that moment. Mm -hmm. It's, it's really to maybe, embody some compassion and sure. rather than being at, accusing or yeah. coming out as an attack yeah. maybe inviting and questioning uh, softly would sure. would invite more collaboration yep yep cool and then last question what do you admire most about you i think my ability to listen mm. i i really try not to uh jump to conclusions yeah and i've learned that usually people's initial uh initial kind of statement in any kind of particular conversation mm -hmm. is there's always something deeper right yeah. and so if they yeah. come out as a as they attack or they're thorny from the outside yeah it means they're really soft on the inside and if i sure. can really focus on that 
then I can I can melt the problem away through the presence and the listening so that they feel understood so that they don't have to be so hard. Sure. Sure. That's great, man. And everyone needs that person in their life where when all else fails, you can go to them, whether you need their, their mind at that moment, you need their ears at that moment, or you need their heart at that moment. So, um, it's an honor to know you, brother. I appreciate that answer. That's, that's beautiful. Um, okay. And on that note, this is my moment to acknowledge you. And, uh, funny enough, although this is a, a, a new developed friendship, we met through a mutual friend and, um, this is actually the, probably the longest we've spoken, <laughs> but, but, but I've done, um, some research on you and, um, and the, and the mutual friend that we have in Brandon, you know, speaks very highly of you and that, that says a lot about, about you. So, um, I just want to acknowledge you for creating the space for people who are struggling to find the motivation in their life to be better, to be successful and to have clarity in their life. Again, as we just, you know, ended your, your answer to the last question, everyone needs someone like you in their life, whether it's a friend, a mentor, uh, a partner, whatever it is. Um, and it's important for me to serve people. It's important for me to help people, for them to feel like they're not alone when they listen, when they watch, and when they're a part of the Who Can Relate community. And I know that that's your mission as well. So that's, it's also um, a beautiful quality about you. Um, I want to acknowledge <laughs> this about you that I'm actually striving to be myself, which is funny enough, we just talked about, which is being a better communicator. You know, I recently over the last couple of years, um, realized that what makes a great communicator is again, as we said, is someone who seeks to understand before they're seeking to be understood, um, to listen and be present with who you're speaking with is so important. And you do that in a way with your tone, with your presence, albeit, you know, your podcast is audio, but I can still feel like it's just you and me. Like you're almost talking to me in a sense. And that's a very difficult skill to, to achieve and, and to have, um, on a daily basis. Um, and it's, it's also, I'm, I'm a big advocate of, you can have the greatest message ever to give somebody, but if the delivery is off, that message will never get across. And the way you deliver your messages where you're not too preachy, you're not too sales pitchy. Um, you have a beautiful way of getting the exact message you want to get across to people. And I'm sure at the right time. So um, that's my acknowledgement for you, brother. It's a, it's an honor to welcome you into my life, into my wife's life. Um, I can't wait for people to um, digest your content, to be a part of what you're trying to do. Uh, we need more like you in this world, and especially um, not only from a man to a man, but a father to a father. Um, there's a type of brotherhood, you know, that we have that we have to abide by, and we have to take full responsibility. In. And uh, people like you give me hope, give me give me the the, the trust in humanity, <laughs> kind of kind of bring it back a little bit. As obviously, 2020 was a little shaky with that department, <laughs> and um, so yeah, so. Um, I so gratefully appreciate you coming on. I appreciate you sharing your message and uh, your wisdom. And uh, I am looking forward to being on your show tomorrow. It's going to be a lot of fun. And if anyone um, really valued today's episode, they're going to be in for a, um, a double or bonus or just more of us um, tomorrow on your platform. So I'm looking forward to it, brother. Brother, thank you so much. Those yeah. words meant a lot and sure. I did my best to receive every one of them so I appreciate you <laughs> I'm sure you did with the way you're able to be present and listen so <laughs> I'm sure you got every bit of it <laughs> so I'm full of gratitude for your brother thank you so much and um, I'll see you tomorrow <laughs> cool respect see you.